huge uh, turnout, particularly since uh, these uh, meetings are now webcast. So if you would like to come up to the tables, and, and uh, we'd love to, to uh, have you participate in the, the uh, deliberations that we have today. This is our new boardroom, and I haven't gotten used to the uh, layout yet. I'm not sure I like it. Hi. Hi. Just sit here so I can see that. If you want to talk, you just punch the little red button. Thank you. Oh, they're already on. Okay, let, let, me, uh, let, let me get, uh, get underway. I'm uh, Raymond Paredes, uh, the Commissioner of Higher Education. As all of you know, uh, we alternate uh, the, chair of the, uh, the chairmanship of this uh, council between uh, the Commissioner of uh, Education, Robert Scott, and me. And uh, so it is my turn to do this for a couple of years. Um, before we introduce uh, the, the, the people up here, because these nameplates aren't uh, entirely accurate, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, before, uh, between the, the, the first meeting uh, we had uh, uh, while I was serving as chair in this one, I called up the members of the uh, council and I asked uh, what they thought we should uh, focus on uh, for the next year, the next, uh, the next four meetings. And... Uh, there was a pretty, uh, pretty strong consensus that we should focus on college readiness and how to take what we're doing uh, beyond uh, the point that it's uh, presently at. And uh, there was some, uh, there was some uh, discussion of, uh, once again, aligning uh, education K through 16 more closely with workforce development and uh, looking at the different uh, points of intervention where we might be able to uh, help students uh, secure jobs. Uh, we've, we've talked about developing programs all the way from minimal skill levels, uh, that is to say people who have basic uh, literacy and computational skills that enables them to, uh, uh, to find jobs and pay a living wage, all the way to uh, making sure that we uh, strength in education through, uh, throughout the pipeline in a manner that uh, it will not only drive the economy, but uh, strengthen the economy and put Texas in a, in a stronger position to compete not only nationally, but internationally. Those were the two recurrent themes. Um, uh, there, was also, uh, th there was also a comment that we needed to be more, there were comments that we needed to be more action-oriented. Uh, that uh, there were there were some candid uh, comments that uh, the uh, council had become uh, mostly uh, uh, a series of reports without any uh, specific actions taken on the part of the council, and uh, there was a feeling that we should uh, we should assert our our role as the statewide P16 council more aggressively, and there was a strong feeling that and, and this maybe seems scary to some of you we should start working on uh, 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 P-16 agenda for the next legislative session. <laughs> so it's, it's never too soon to begin. Um, so uh, I, I, I told the members uh, that, um, that I, would, uh, I would do that, and, and uh, we will talk about uh, some of these issues beginning today. Uh, furthermore, uh, I, I consulted with... Um, uh, members of the council, the statutory members of the council, and uh, I think there was a there was a consensus with a recommendation that I made that we should increase the size of the council. That uh, at, at seven, it's it's simply too small to represent all the groups that ought to be at the table and talking about P16 issues, um, particularly in a state as large as Texas. So I propose that. Uh, I, with my colleagues uh, here at the coordinating board, would look for uh, some kind of mechanism to change the statute so that we could expand uh, the council to 11, and per, 11, 11 permanent members. And uh, uh, we'll have to get, as I said, statutory authority to do that. And we're looking at ways that we can, we can get that support at the legislature. So those are some of the things that we're working on. We, we do recognize that we, we have an important function to uh, fill 
at the statewide level, but we, we have to be more action-oriented and we have to identify critical issues and we have to develop uh, recommendations and agendas to, to make certain that uh, we fulfill our statutory mission. So uh, with that, um, let me um, first of all ask uh, the people around the table to introduce themselves. Uh, we expect that uh, Larry Temple will be here momentarily, but we have a couple of replacements, and I want to make sure that for permanent members, I want to make sure that everyone identifies him or herself. So, David? Hi. My name is David Hagerla, and I'm the director of the Center for Policy and Innovation at Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services, and I'm here for Commissioner Deborah Wanzer this afternoon. Thank you. And I'm Jennifer Jacob. I am the policy coordinator for adult education at the Texas Education Agency. And I would like to express uh, Commissioner Scott and Deputy Commissioner uh, Reynolds' apologies for not being able to be here. Okay. I'm Clint Winters. I'm here representing uh, Executive Director uh, Larry Temple, who is on his way and should be here shortly. I'm with Workforce Business Services at the Workforce Commission. Thank you. And, and uh, Phyllis uh, Snodgrass called me or sent me an email and said she will try to be here if possible. She has a, a personal uh, conflict that uh, will certainly make her late and uh, may require that she miss a meeting altogether. So with that, uh, we'll, uh, we, we, don't have a, we don't have an official quorum, so we can't uh, approve the minutes. So we'll go on and, and uh, start with... Um, um, the update on the uh, uh, Generation Texas campaign. So with that. Thanks, Commissioner. A clicker, you want me to advance with me? I can do it. That's good. That's great. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Thanks to uh, each of you. I'm Shannon Ratliff. You'll note on your agenda, I am not Catherine Jones. Uh, I'm Shannon Ratliff with Milkshake Media, and pleased to be back with you uh, to give you an update on Generation Texas and our activities uh, around the state. Um, it's good to uh, good to see you, Commissioner. I've seen you. I know you're uh, in the trenches over there at the Capitol, day in, day out, and uh, appreciate all the effort over there. Uh, so. I'd like to give you a quick update on Generation Texas. I looked back at our calendar, and the last time that we were before the state P-16 Council was in May 2010. Um, and at that time, that we had just been, uh, we were several months out from having been awarded the contract, and really, Generation Texas, uh, we had some concepts, but it was really kind of a glimmer in our eyes. And there's a lot of, of work that's gone into the, uh, into the campaign since that time, and really excited to uh, bring you up to speed on some of the progress that's been made to date. Um, with Generation Texas. For those of you who might not have been exposed to the campaign before, I think most of you have, but let me give you just a quick summation, and that is Generation Texas is a statewide initiative, and it's aimed at creating a college-going and career-ready culture across the state of Texas. We also have some specific tactical goals underneath that in terms of increasing awareness and support for the college and career readiness standards and knowledge of what college readiness means in really practical terms for students and parents. Um, in addition to familiarizing students and parents with the processes of applying for admission and student financial aid. So we've got this sort of big macro goal of creating this culture that everybody around this table, everyone in this room today is working to create, um, as well as these very specific um, tactical goals, which are the task-based goals students have to complete on this path to post-secondary education. I think it's been said many times, it's uh, for all Texas students, although primarily focused on those students who would be the first in their family to pursue post-secondary education um, or who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. We piloted this in two initial markets in uh, Tarrant County in North Texas and in 15 school districts in Bear County, although right now we're in the process of rolling it out into some additional expansion markets in the state. So that's kind of high-level background for you. Um, the slide that you see here um, is really our sort of manifesto, our brand mantra for Generation Texas. It's what we believe about these Texas students, what they must believe about themselves, and what we know you know, are the hopes and aspirations that everyone in this room shares for them. Um, we're strong, we're independent, we're ready for careers, we support our families, we want to go to college, we face new challenges, we have unlimited potential. 
We believe in our future. We follow our dreams. We're the leaders of tomorrow. We are Generation Texas. As we've implemented this campaign, um, there are a couple things about it that I really want to say, and we we continue to learn every day, which is a really a great privilege. Um, but it's not um, it's different in kind from many things that you may be familiar with. It's not a specific education intervention. It's not a program like an Avid or a Gear Up. It is really about an idea, an ideal, an aspiration. That's what Generation Texas is. Generation Texas is these students, and it's this goal that we want all of these students and all of the communities around these students to aspire towards. And in that way, we hope that it provides the platform, the infrastructure to support the many, many good interventions and initiatives that are happening on the ground around the state. So that's a really important thing to understand about the orientation of Generation Texas and really speaking in the student's voice and what we, what we hope for these students. Um, uh, it's about, there, and there's a, a part of this really that is about the power of storytelling. And Mary, you're gonna have to click for me on that Get Inspired link with your mouse there. We're gonna see if this, if we have the internet access to do this, perfect. All right, I'm gonna just run this real quick from here. This is something I really wanna share with each of you. I know, uh, Commissioner, you've seen this before, um, but maybe some of the other members of your, of your panel have not. And it really says, I think, much more eloquently than I really could, um, expresses what I'm telling you about the, the idea, the ideal behind Generation Texas. I'm just going to escape from that. Just pull, just pull it down. I thought we were going to have some audio for this. Well, I'll just tell you about this real quick. I'm from San Antonio, um, Texas. Oh, here we go. Now if we can just get the image back up. My parents are divorced. I used to live with my mom, and I took care of my little brother and my little sister because my mom was always working. I did everything, cooked, cleaned, washed, everything. My dad didn't go to college. My mom didn't go to college. I will be the first out of <coughs> my family to actually go to college. I need to be the role model. I need to get things done. I need to start working now, studying harder, you know, turning my work in on time. I think I would say that's one of my biggest problems. I have to really, you know, buckle down and, you know, get my work in on time, do good on my test. SATs are coming up to junior year. I know it's gonna take a lot of hard work. My dad, you know, he always tells me, go to college, go to college, but he doesn't know, you know, how hard the work is. He didn't go, his, his parents didn't go, so I don't think he exactly knows how hard it is gonna, gonna be to get there. I think talking to my dad about financial aid would probably be complicated. I mean, I don't think that he would want me to know how much he makes in a year. So having him to write it down on paper, I think would be hard for him and me. Dad, I need your help in helping me fill out financial aid papers. It may be hard, but together we can do it. It's something that needs to get done and it will help me with college, which is something you want me to do. You know, what needs to be done needs to be done, you know. We are strong, we are independent, we are ready for careers, we support our families, we want to go to college, we face new challenges, we have unlimited potential, we believe in our future, we follow our dreams, we are leaders of tomorrow. I've never been told, you know, you're strong. I've never been told, you know, you can do it. So, I, I'm determined like this, just, makes me want to do it all the more. <laughs> Generation Texas is awesome. When I heard about it, I was like, oh, wow, you know, that's amazing that there's people out there who are helping young people get together and help each other, you know. that That's amazing. I want to do it, too. That's really cool. I am who I say I am, and I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna be strong and independent, and I'm gonna find my career, and I'm gonna go to college. My name is Adeseli, and I am Generation Texas. So, uh, Commissioner, I know you've seen that one before. There are 21 stories just, just like that. And, uh, and what it really uh, grabs for me is that these students can speak to their experience so much more eloquently than I, I could never have written that. But it really drives home a point that is, is tremendously important. It's reinforced with us every day. And that is, there really is the power of this belief. You've got to believe that this is a destination, that this is a goal, that this is something that I can aspire to. Um, and that's really powerful because that's the motivation that keeps you going when you encounter the obstacles that you all of these students encounter on this path. And I really can't overstate um, the importance of that. Um, so I just want to sum up, and I'm going to point down the road here a bit, but Generation Texas really, again, it's not a program, it's a, it's a movement, it's a vision, it's a dream for what we want to achieve for Texas, and it really is this, this culture. And part of what we're hoping to achieve with Generation Texas is really a lexicon for what college and career readiness means. That's a mouthful to say. It's about college and career readiness. Well, we really want people to start saying it's about creating Generation Texas because that's a concrete vision that we can all really, we can grasp, you can see it, you can see these students every day and they're the future of this state. So we really hope that in each of you are leaders in your particular uh, uh, segment of Texas government leading this charge. We really hope that we'll start to see you adopting this language. I know I've heard uh, Commissioner Paredes speak about Generation Texas. So that's really what we're all trying to create together is Generation Texas, this future. And one thing that we learned as we went into the field is, again, uh, from the very inception of this program, we didn't need to create another intervention. What we needed was to create a platform that highlighted and elevated and unified all of the many tremendous efforts that are going around, on around the state. So the people in the programs that are creating Generation Texas, they're, they're all around you in any community that you go to in this state, and we meet them every day. And so that's really, that's tremendous. The, the storytelling that you saw from RSLE, but also the storytelling that people do on a one-to-one -one basis about how education has changed their lives. We're trying to set up those conversations online and in the community because part of believing that it's possible is really having someone model that for you and, and give you that encouragement. Um, you'll see some other things that, that we believe about Generation Texas here. One I particularly want to touch on because it might not be readily apparent to you is also, and you'll see it further in the presentation, is the symbols of Generation Texas. There are a lot of wearables in the brand system, other things that got the Generation Texas logo on it. And why is that important? Generation Texas becomes this signifier, this wayfinding tool for these students and for these parents. And when they see it, they know, ah, that's about college access for me. So it signifies that for them. But it also identifies them as being part of the same tribe, sharing the same goals, and identifies those people that support them as being part of that as well, whether you're in college access and recruitment at an institution of higher education, uh, or you're a, a high school counselor, or someone who runs a nonprofit or an intervention in the community, or maybe just a parent or a neighbor. It's a way that we recognize as each of us as being part of creating Generation Texas and supporting these students. So what I'm pleased to report is that it's starting, it's happening all over the state. What you're seeing here are images um, from the pilot markets primarily of grassroots because it really, we do have a, a robust website, but it's also about what happens on the ground. So there are two primary concepts that I want you to leave today's presentation with. One is this notion of Generation Texas as an idea and as a language about college uh, readiness and, and career readiness. The second is that one of community ownership. When we first had discussions with Commissioner Paredes and with the coordinating board, um, it was very clear to us that you can't drive creating a culture from here. You can help, you can foster it, you can cultivate it, 
but you cannot create it by yourself. Well, the where it gets created is in the communities. And the other concept I want you to leave with, and I'll show you how it's happening, is the notion of community ownership. Someone has to step up in these communities. They have to own this effort, and we provide the tools and the platform to enable them to do that. So we're trying to enable that, whether it's through a P16 council, through a, a local mayor who's passionate about education, an institution of higher education, or, or a public school system. Um, it really starts with the students. The students have got to be at the center of it. And what we've found and what we've learned again and again, and I've talked to students, you name part of the state, I've probably been there in the last 18 months, talking to AVID programs, gear up programs, students at college fairs, um, and I'll harken back to the videos for a minute because I will tell you one just sort of as an aside that um, when I talk to them, there's a lot of low-level sort of chatter going on in the back of the room, as you might have found when you talk to students yourselves. But when you show them those videos, they are a powerful tool. <laughs> Heads pivot, they lock on. It really conveys for them in a really powerful way. Um, it, it, caps, it captures part of their experience. And so that's a really great tool. But the students have got to believe in it. The students have got to adopt it. And, uh, and I think Generation Texas has been really successful in that regard. Um, You'll see a lot of the brand imagery looks like the people of Texas, and that's what we hear again. Um, I just want to show you sort of the, the variety that you see there. Um, I talked about the symbols of Generation Texas. You'll see it's this very flexible set of symbols that allow different organizations and entities and individuals to take it on and show their support because making that support visible in the community, letting students know that they're not treading this path by themselves is really a critical dimension of making this tip, making this happen. Um, Gentex.org. So Gentex.org is the website that we created to um, support this campaign. One really exciting piece of news that we just got in the last 24 hours or so that I'm really pleased to share with you and really pleased that we were able to do on behalf of this initiative is that Gentex.org uh, is an honoree for the Webbies, which is a national award. It is the only state initiative of its kind to be honored in this way. Most of the other uh, awards that you see, the honorees and nominees that you see there are national programs. So the state of Texas is really standing out in this regard, and we're really uh, just pleased that the, the work's been recognized in that way. But let me just quickly cover for you what Gentex.org aims to do. We looked around and we said, gee, there are a million websites. If you run a search for college access, financial aid, you name it, you're going to pull up a bunch of stuff. What we really tried to do with gentex.org was create a platform and unify that in, in these ways. One is we tried to create a community, an online community that's like Facebook or other social media platforms you might be familiar with, but it's all around readiness and preparing for, applying for, and paying for college and getting those conversations going because we all know that students can be confused and where do I look? How do I learn about this? Maybe my parents don't have exposure to that college going experience. So this is one way that they can share with one another. That community continues to grow at a robust pace and we're really pleased about that. Um, in addition, um, we've got obviously a Facebook page and a presence on that platform as well and we see a lot of students congregating there. So we're really trying to find places for them to congregate and it's not just for students, it's also for supporters. Groups that are delivering interventions and information to students host discussions as part of this community that provide valuable information to students and parents. Community calendars. There is a, an online calendar that communities participate in loading their college access events to. It's geo-targeted, it's searchable by English and Spanish, by topic, by where I am in my education career, and again, I can find it by entering my hometown, my zip code, I can find that stuff that's relevant to me. It's a really powerful tool. Stories. You saw one of the stories today, but really stories of local heroes, that inspiration piece. I won't dwell on that in any further great detail. What we call the Make It Happen section. There are about 300 resources on this site divided up into how to prepare, how to apply, and how to pay. The students and the users rate these resources, so the best resources float to the top. And then finally, a download center. And I'll talk about why that's important, but basically we look around, and I don't have to tell anyone in this room, that given the budgetary constraints that higher education 
and that public education are operating under in this state at present, that we needed to create some low cost tools that people in the community could use. These tools in the Download Center help them to drive both the, the very tactical goals that we're about, but also drive awareness and drive referrals to gentex.org and getting people involved in the community and online in this movement. They're totally free of charge. Um, they're pretty neat, pretty sophisticated tools, and we've had great success with those. I'll just tell you from a partner development standpoint, um, we continue to see, we saw a 32% increase in Q1 in downloads with about uh, 600 downloads in Q1 from Download Center. So that's great. That means people around the state are really picking it up and running with it. I'll show you, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. This is that community ownership piece. It really comes down to the willingness of a community to take this on, to own it, and to use Generation Texas again as a lever, as a spotlight to identify those programs, those resources, whether they're within the four walls of the school or without, to help the students in that community get on this path to post-secondary education. You'll see a lot of examples here. Some of them are very kind of DIY um, efforts. Some of them, like the you see Tarrant County College up there in the upper left-hand corner of my screen here, uh, where we rebranded their mobile go center and that's really been a great outreach tool for them in uh, in Tarrant County uh, one thing we're really excited about and what this is intended to illustrate is in places that we haven't even been yet people are picking this up they're taking it on they're doing it the response that I find is tremendous I've had the opportunity recently to present to a lot of counselors through the education service centers and let me tell you counselors in particular the ones that work with these kids on a day-in day-out basis they get it they see the value of these tools and they are using them and we get requests by the SCADs every week to come out and train counselors in using these tools, which is a really, really encouraging sign. And again, it's happening in places that we haven't even been yet. They're finding out about it and they're taking it on themselves. This is a great example of through the P16 councils of communities that have taken it on and made this happen. They're holding events. You can see uh, Janie Ramirez down there in the corner. With, she's got all of her Generation Texas branded uh, materials and backdrops. They did, they've done some terrific stuff with their kids there in Lubbock and in Beaumont. Uh, they actually did a day where they went to a local TV station and the, and the students were thinking about careers. Where do I want to go? What do I need to do? And they were actually operating a lot of the equipment and things for this uh, the special newscast that they created. I'm going to highlight some key partnerships here. This is a partnership in Tarrant County College with their um, with their college recruitment efforts. They touch students all over Tarrant County. Obviously, we co-branded extensively with them. We had our uh, web launch event with them last year. Commissioner Paredes was there. The governor was in attendance, and a lot of local dignitaries from that community. So that was tremendously successful. But the really great news is they've continued to use the brand as part of their outreach efforts to get the students engaged and get them on this path. And part of it really is being in a position to initiate that conversation. San Antonio has really taken this on and taken this concept of community ownership to the next level. In San Antonio, the P-16 spun out its own 501c3 called Generation Texas San Antonio to implement this initiative, as well as some other student-focused initiatives that they wanted to do in that community. You see some photos here from uh, Rock Your Future Gen Tex Fest, which was a great awareness event that they held there at the Alamo Convocation Center, brought 2,000 kids and their parents together and really heightened awareness and was an opportunity, again, for us to drive specific messages about college readiness. This was all focused on ninth grade students. Um, so 2,000 ninth graders in one place, you can imagine the place was, uh, the place was jumping. Uh, that's been a great ongoing partnership. Advise Texas, another tremendous initiative. Some of you may know it as the Texas College Advising Corps. It's part of a national program. We help to rebrand them as Advise Texas. Um, they're going to be in 120 schools across the state of Texas in partnership with institutions of higher education, and they're going to carry Generation Texas into those schools. So it's going to give us really great broad distribution with a peer-to-peer -peer network or near-peer network um, in many schools around the state. So that's, that's a tremendous partnership. Partnership. Down in the Rio Grande Valley, which is another uh, region that we're focused on, we have a partnership with Abrin de Puertas, which is a parental engagement initiative, carrying this message into communities in the Rio Grande Valley, and a tremendous partnership with, uh, with UT Pan American, who's really used this particularly with their college and high school G-forces down there. Um, they have done some tremendous work with Generation Texas and really taking advantage of, of this offering. 
This is a new one that we're really excited about and, and really, uh, really pleased to bring to you in partnership with Vince Young. Those of you who are Longhorn fans, uh, maybe even some of you who aren't will remember Vince when he uh, led the Longhorns to a national championship. But he has his own foundation in Houston, and he speaks really quite eloquently um, and in some unexpected ways to the value of education. And really, uh, you know, the thing that's really great about Vince, in addition to the many great offerings that he's doing in Houston, and it, we've got a, a partnership underway with him in the Houston market, but um, most students wouldn't think that after you'd gone on to the NFL that you would continue to value your education and that you would continue to pursue finishing your degree. And Vince is doing that. And I think that really um, is, is a powerful message to students. And he really, in a very low key way, um, brings that across. So that's, that's a really exciting partnership in the Houston market. These are the markets that we, the major markets that we're already entering right now to build a beachhead in preparation for the 11, 12 school year. You'll, I'll explain to you some of the activities that are ongoing right now in those markets. We've learned a lot from the pilot markets about how to enter a market, who the logical partners are, and who these community owners can be. And that, I will say, um, has been a great, uh, great source of learning. It's allowing us to enter these markets much more smoothly, much more effectively with some of those learnings under our belt. We also, I want to be careful to point out, because they have been tremendous partners, the P-16 councils around the state have embraced this through some, a number of great opportunities the coordinating board and TA and others have made possible. Uh, the P-16s, they understand this. They are bringing together those key stakeholders and they are taking on, and in many markets, it will be the P-16 who is the owner of this initiative, who's prepared to drive this forward. Because what we say about creating these community-based brands is we know they're successful when people start to do things with them that we didn't ask them to do. Because again, you can support it, you can foster it, but you cannot drive it from Austin, Texas. It's got to happen on the ground in these communities. I want to talk to you a little bit about outcomes. Uh, first, I'll just share with you some metrics, what we know to date. Um, you know, on gentext.org, we've got over 150,000 page views, over 16,000 unique visitors to the site, average time on the site of north of five minutes, which means they're finding things that they need. Our repeat visitor uh, rate is very, very high. Video plays are very high. And again, we're seeing a lot of uh, active downloads in that download center, and a lot of people adding events to these calendars to make that a robust tool in these communities. So um, we're seeing a lot of, of engagement there. On the under short-term outcomes, those are really engagement and awareness metrics that are all oriented around the three goals for the campaign that were established by the coordinating board. In the long-term outcomes column, those are measurements that we're taking to see over time, are we really creating this behavioral change, this cultural change that we all aspire to create? You'll see some of the key kind of performance indicators in that regard. Um, one thing that we've done, and this is an innovation that we've started to roll some of these out, and I'm going to talk in particular about one of them, what we found in terms of helping to support local communities, it's really helpful to have some seasonal focuses, some hooks in the year that they can plan their activities around. And we've got three. One is what we call, you saw it implemented in San Antonio, we sort of uh, beta tested it there, but rock your future, which is really about no matter where you are in that continuum, identifying, okay, what do I need to know to take that next step on the path to post-secondary education. That happens in the, in the fall, back to school, September, October timeframe. There's a financial aid and FAFSA focus, uh, which happens in the January, February when, when FAFSA goes live. And then in May, there's Generation Texas Day, which is really about celebrating those students that are taking that next step and making that something that the students and siblings that are coming up behind them, they aspire to. We celebrate it. We make it a big deal in the community. So they're like, wow, that's cool. I want to be part of that too. I want to talk to you a little bit about Generation Texas Day because that's coming up on May the 20th. We were trying to create something that was very low friction, very low cost, very easy to implement. The very basic thing that anybody can, can do, and we hope that everyone in this room will do, is wear your favorite college t-shirt that day. Wear the shirt of where you taught, where you went to school, a school you love, a school you hope to go to. It's a way, again, of making this culture visible. And we're asking high schools to do it. We're asking all of you to do it. And it's just chambers, businesses, and their employees. It's just a really great way to make it visible and make it very participatory. 
You'll note that the download center that I've talked about on gentex.org, we're creating kits for communities that they can deploy, again, in a very low cost way, whether it's on a campus or in a community or a, a boys and girls club. Uh, and those will be available on the website on April the 25th. A senior spotlight template that really says, hey, here are our seniors and here's what they're doing next in their lives. That's really something that should be a source of excitement for everybody that's part of that campus community. Um, some promotions, some messages that they can display on their marquees and signs in their community to say, hey, we're part of this. We're part of this because remember, we're trying to create this collective identity, this collective aspiration. Um, reading the Generation Texas Manifesto, um, getting mayors to issue proclamations, declaring it Gentex Day in their city. So some really nice hooks that will again drive awareness because we're building a beachhead and a celebration as they exit the school year so that as we roll into 2011 and 2012, we've got a good head of steam and we've already had some exposure in these additional expansion markets. So uh, that is a somewhat breathless tour in the time we've got available at Generation Texas. I'd be delighted to answer any questions that any of you or any folks in the room have for me. And thanks again for the opportunity to be back with you here at the State P16 Council. Members, any questions? I, I have a, I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I was uh, I was at the, the, the rollout in, in San Antonio, and I was struck by the fact that uh, there were how many high school students here? Three thousand, something like that. It was it, it was a very significant turnout, particularly on a Saturday afternoon. Yes, sir. And I thought the event was was exciting, and it generated a lot of excitement among the students. But um, research, uh, particularly uh, research that was done by some of the, the GIRA projects, has shown that if you, ha if you have a kid who's, who's on the fence about going to college, they, they found that, that uh, you need typically eight or nine active interventions with that, that, that uh, young person to really persuade that person that uh, he or she should should go to college, and and my question is, what, what's what kind of follow up are you monitoring at the local level? For example, what was happening? I think virtually all of those kids were from uh, San Antonio ISD. Is that correct? Yeah, they were. Uh, they were actually from other independent school districts as well. There were 15, so about 10 or 12 school districts. Okay, so there. but let let's just pick, pick San Antonio one. ISD. Sure. Uh, I, I, I thought it was prim primarily San Antonio ISD kids because I saw the superintendent from San Antonio there. But uh, I asked, what, what are going to be the local follow-up activities at the, at the high schools? Right. Because once, once again, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like a revival meeting. <laughs> you know, people go up and say they're excited about... Uh, about uh, rediscovering their faith, but unless there's real active follow-up, they right. usually re revert to their old habits. Sunday morning versus Monday morning. Precisely. We're getting personal in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, yeah, that's what, a, what are we doing? What, what, how is Generation Texas making sure that there's there's, there's follow-up, or what are you doing to promote follow-up? Absolutely. That's a great question, Commissioner. Um, and there's a lot that's being done in that regard. So we've worked very closely with our partners at Generation Texas San Antonio. They have a full and ongoing schedule of events that they are implementing, much of it with support from the statewide campaign. And it's very much focused on delivering those messages, reinforcing those messages. I think the other thing I would say about that is we have been in a bunch of those schools since January of this year, either our outreach teams directly or through programs. Because again, um, it's about creating an ecosystem. Um, and you're absolutely right. In fact, in my conversations with counselors, they're, they say, you know, sometimes it takes three, four, five, eight touches with a kid before the light goes on, before they're like, ah, got it, okay. So that's why we've really got to um, continue to penetrate into the schools through the counselors. It's why we're delivering the ESC trainings. It's why we just delivered a training, for instance, in an adjoining school district in Komal. Um, so the ESCs are proving to be great platforms to disseminate this. We're partnering with groups like AVID programs and Gear Up programs that are in the school on a day in, day out basis. And in particular, looking forward, it's why we're really excited about this partnership with Advice Texas, because you will have 120 near peer advisors in high need schools across the state. So I don't 
Um, I don't want anyone to leave for a minute thinking that we think our job is done when, you, as you say, you have a big event, everyone gets excited, but if you don't follow that up with a step that I can take, then it was just a momentary flash of excitement. So we're very mindful of that, and we're uh, while we're letting partners implement, we are staying in very close contact. In fact, there's an evaluation meeting that's happening with our partners at Generation Texas San Antonio this week so that we can track how that's progressing in the San Antonio market specifically. Well, one, one, uh, one further comment. Um, as, as we link Generation uh, Texas and uh, advise Texas more closely. Yes, sir. Uh, I would really like to make sure that we involve the Texas Workforce Commission because as you know, Generation Texas is, is simply encouraging students to think about post-secondary education. Yes, sir. It can be in a community college, it can be in a technical college, it can be in a university. And one of the things that, that uh, I would like to see, um, and I'm speaking to staff here at the coordinating board as well, is that the Texas Workforce Commission has developed some wonderful materials, including uh, DVDs uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, highlight the different careers that students can go into post-secondary. Uh, and we really need to take advantage of those. We need to make sure that the students in Advise Texas have access to those so they can show them to the students that, that they're working with. Sure. Uh, we're, we're going to, to speak to officials of institutions of higher education to make sure that those materials are available and uh, orientation programs for, for incoming students. But I, I think it would, they would be most effective if we would work on these materials for high school students mm -hmm. and take advantage of the materials that are already there and use advice and, and have uh, advise Texas and the Texas Workforce Commission to work very closely together to uh, not only use available materials but to develop new materials as this uh, as, as both Advice Texas and Generation Texas uh, become better known across the state and work more closely together. That's I think that's a great point, Commissioner. We'd be delighted to work with Workforce Commission on that. And I think uh, we have a weekly planning meeting with Advice Texas. I'll be sure to mention that to Matt Orham, who directs that program. And also, again, from the Generation Texas standpoint, it's about this ecosystem and this platform. So we'd love to use the platform to help further disseminate the great work that the Workforce Commission's done. So absolutely, we'll follow through on that, Commissioner. Larry, do you have anything to say about that? Well, you know, we have a real strong summer youth program for disadvantaged kids. That's a great plug-in to it. Um, uh, and the parents uh, that we touch just that are looking for work um, that's a great resource too because a lot of times they're trying to figure out how to pay for college and right. how to get a kid in college so to be able to have that as a desktop reference uh, uh, for a referral and that sort of thing would be would be really really helpful so and our local boards you know, some more than others are involved in the, in the local P-16. Absolutely. So that'd be the great, that's, that's the low-hanging fruit to start with them first. And, uh, Larry, who's your, who's your contact? Who, who do you uh, recommend as your contact uh, person? Clint, Clint Winters uh, okay. would be our contact, and he can uh, get you all the information at the local level. But, uh, you know, the areas that you're in are, are very, you know, aggressive with new initiatives and right. have good youth programs. And we had almost 30,000 kids working in a summer youth program last summer, so they Terrific. touch a lot of kids. Those would be great resources that we can help promote through, obviously through gentex.org and through other sure. channels, so we'd, we'd love to do that right. very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. I just had a question. It sounds like a really great program. I hadn't seen a lot about it until uh, seeing your presentation, but is there any target toward students who might have a learning disability or a student who might be visually impaired or have a physical impairment that would in the same way challenge them or involve them into something like this and whether or not your website has is accessible is mm -hmm. it has a features in it accessible to students who might not be able to access it in the the way that others were right that's a great that's a great question um we have um we would welcome that and we'd love if there are resources that your agency is aware of that we could better integrate we'd like to do that um as you might imagine we have uh, while certainly i'd say generous but uh by by 
it's a statewide campaign, and so in order to have a statewide campaign, we really are, have tried to kind of focus um, in these key geographic markets um, and really, you know, to the point that uh, Mr. Temple and Chris were making, try to find that low-hanging fruit. We would be delighted to if there are communities that we are not serving that we could better serve, and there are some uh, insights that you could share with us. I'd love to I'd love to speak with the appropriate staff at your agency to, to we identify have a, that. Uh, electronic accessibility team actually that supports the health and human services about making electronic media and all accessible and right. some of it may be easily you know introduced into the website or you know Think, other things that are in pdf are not uh, right. traditionally not very accessible in jaws for for the, the, the sight impaired so right. to the degree that you have a lot of things that are in a pdf aren't going to come across you have to have an alternative there for right. for jaws so Right. Uh, your your tech people need to look at JAWS mm -hmm. and see how it uh, how this would uh, do that. Because right. all of our state agencies, we have to we right. have to adhere to that. And right. for us to be supporting things that aren't is kind of a problem. So we need to we need to get behind that uh, as, as quickly as possible. But we certainly do have some resources and would love to work with you if at all possible. That, if, if there's an appropriate contact to your agency, I'd like to have it, and that'd be great probably be me it's in my area where the accessibility team is but very we, good we can touch base okay. at some point thanks very much i appreciate that Shannon, what's your what's, what's your level of cooperation with tea have you all been working closely with tea on some of these some of these issues we we have um and particularly through the advice texas partnership obviously ta was instrumental in helping to recruit students for that program so that's been a big way um we also have had some communication with ta in terms of of online resource and other things although i would say that's probably not as recent but if there are other things that the TA would be interested in collaborating on, delighted to do that. We always welcome TA support. It's such a wealth of knowledge, and particularly as we access these K-12 students and the high school students in particular, um, TA support is really invaluable to the program. So, absolutely. And I'm actually on the Advise Texas uh, committee, so we have a meeting tomorrow. Oh, that's super. great. That's really good to hear. Good. Well, thank you very much. It's exciting to hear about Thanks, you know, what y'all are doing. I I'd like to... Um, uh, take a moment and, and note um, uh, a tragedy that we've we've experienced related to uh, Generation Texas. Uh, the, the, the lead uh, the, the lead person um, here at the coordinating board on Generation Texas was uh, Andy Kessling, and Andy had uh, uh, became ill about uh, well I guess close to a year ago, right when we were. Uh, getting serious about launching uh, Generation Texas. I know he was instrumental yes. in working directly with uh, you all and uh, and working with media in different parts of the state. And uh, I know that he was uh, he was absolutely central to uh, to helping uh, uh, launch Generation Texas and serving as a liaison between the coordinating board and uh, and uh, Milkshake Media. Um, Andy uh, died uh, last Friday. And uh, his loss will be a, will be uh, deeply felt by all of us here at the coordinating board who worked with him, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the folks at uh, Milkshake Media had a similar regard for his abilities, his compassion, and his commitment to educational attainment. Uh, he was only 49 years old, and we will we will miss him terribly. So thanks thanks for uh, making that recognition. I I'd like to just add to that, Commissioner, that. Everybody here um, had just great reason to be so um, proud of Andy and his passion for education, the way that he represented this agency. I spent a lot of hours over the last year riding around the state with Andy, and um, in my many years of working, I can think of no more high caliber um, quality uh, person that we worked with. And I'll just tell you anecdotally that when this Webby Award announcement came out, the very first thing that someone at our shop said was, Andy would have been really proud. So we'll we'll miss Andy dearly as well, and I appreciate you making that recognition, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, let, let's uh, move on to the next item on our agenda, a presentation on developmental education, uh, one of the demonstration project sites. Uh, let me, a little background. Uh, the legislature was kind enough to uh, give the coordinating board a, a a uh, relatively small amount of money uh, to uh, uh, take a look at developmental education and see how we can improve it. Although there have been 
There's been spotty improvement around the state. We know the developmental education is absolutely one of the the the, 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 the terrible bottlenecks we have in the, the educational pipeline P through 16 that prevent uh, young people from achieving their educational goals. And so we have uh, funded some some demonstration sites with the idea that uh, essentially we're we're, we're going to uh, completely overturn developmental education and start all over. And uh, we funded those projects, uh, we funded those sites, those institutions that have the deepest commitment to fundamental change. And so we're, we're, we're interested in, in uh, hearing about uh, the latest developments because le I, I can say categorically, not only for the audience here, but for people that are listening to the web broadcast, if we don't fix developmental education in Texas, we are not going to reach our educational goals. And so it's, it's, so there's nothing more fundamental than what's going on at the local level, particularly at community colleges that have to bear the, the lion's share of the work in this area. Unless we, we get some really significant uh, innovation and, and, uh, and improvement in results uh, at the local level in this area, we're, we're going to be in trouble. Con we're going to continue to underachieve as a state and. In, in educational attainment, so uh, not wanting to put too much pressure on you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Could I say one thing before Absolutely. you get started? Thank you. Thank you. Echo that, but also addressing why we're having to look at developmental education and looking at the, the, the parents who are having to pay tuition for things that don't count and money's out the door because they're son or daughter got out of high school without being able to do it. And we've got to address that. There's got to be improvement there to where you don't have a need for this grant anymore. <laughs> oh, that's, that that's would wonderful. be a wonderful thing. <laughs> we'll find you something else to do, but. Uh. I'm sure we'll stay busy, but yeah, it's a wonderful goal to shoot for. I want to thank the coordinating board for their leadership in this. I think that you're exactly correct. I mean, I know you're exactly correct. We're all involved in this, and we've got to address this more aggressively than we have in the past. And I think this is you've given us that opportunity to do that. And I also want to thank you for the, the for for the fact that we received the grant at El Paso Community College. We realize that when we talk about developmental education, we're talking about a field, an area that is so important. And in my slides, I'll show you in a moment that we have uh, po probably around 11,000 students at El Paso Community College in developmental education in any given semester. So it is a big priority for us. At the same time, we don't have any PhD programs, master's program, or bachelor's programs. We have a few and more coming, but very few in the nation. So it's not a targeted, identified field, even though many people have dedicated a lot of time to this. So there's not in, not as much research as we need. There aren't people that are graduating, as many people as we need graduating with this. So we're, a, uh, and we have adjunct faculty that teaches most of our developmental courses. We are certainly, we in most institutions, developmental education does not get the attention, the money, or the time that other programs in other areas do. So we are really fighting an uphill battle. But there's much improvement, and I would like to at least share with you what we're doing in El Paso. Um, I'm just going to give you some basic uh, general information on the DEDP. I'll give you some information on El Paso, on El Paso Community College, our interventions. And then one portion of our grant is called the Adult Basic Innovations Grant. And so I'll discuss that with you, and then I'll talk with you about some of our partnerships. Um, the purpose of DEDP is to reform developmental education programs for underprepared students in post-secondary institutions. Not a small task. Um, our rationale, as the commissioner has explained, is obviously half of the students that enroll who are at the lower levels of uh, academic preparation do not usually finish a program of study and are usually gone from our campuses within a year. Uh, and again, we need, we need to address this if we're ever to meet our closing the gaps uh, targets. 
the model. And I'm using Tamara Clunis's model because I think it, it just um, has uh, hit home for us in a very important way. Uh, there are seven areas that the coordinating board has asked us to address, but more importantly, we need to address it in a co coordinated fashion. And that's one of the things that is missing with developmental education. Sometimes it's not as coordinated as it needs to be. But we've been asked to look at our curriculum in math, in reading, and writing, and to revamp it and redesign what we're doing. We've also been asked, and I'm starting at the top with that first um, bubble there. Uh, we've also been asked to, um, to work with our adult basic education partners. And this has been a wonderful aspect of this grant, and I'll talk more about that. We've also been asked to look at the Texas Success Initiative policies that impact our particular institution. There's a list here. The next area is faculty development, and this is very critical. As I said a little while ago, we don't have enough faculty who have had specific training in pedagogy, in strategies, and in, in developmental education. And so, through the grant, we have been addressing this um, in a variety of fashions. Uh, support services, all college campuses have tutoring, and other support services, but we need to be specific. If it's a student with a developmental course need, they need to, uh, the support services such as tutoring need to be targeted, they need to be mandatory, and we need to follow up on the effectiveness. Evaluation is a very important part of the grant. Each of the pilots that we are undertaking have been, will be rigorously evaluated. Assessment is another area. All of us have placement test testing, mandated placement testing uh, for developmental education and English as a second language, but we realize that we need more than just placement testing, especially for some of our students. So we're addressing assessment and finally advising. Even though we have counselors and advisors on all the college campuses, we need to be more targeted and have more uh, structured, more structured um, uh, activities. Uh, for students in developmental education. Um, what we consider success will be that we have fewer students dropping out of our of developmental education, that they complete more of their credit hours for which they've enrolled with, a, with better grades, and of course that they meet the Texas Success Initiative requirements. We also want to have more structured activities that will help students up front, and we want to have more professional development. Um, in El Paso, El Paso Community College, we are building upon a campus-wide commitment to improve um, developmental education. We uh, received a planning grant with achieving, for Achieving the Dream in 2004 and then received the grant in 2005. We are currently in Achieving the Dream Leader College, and we've also received the Gates-funded Developmental Education Initiative. Uh, I say this because I want to focus on how important uh, addressing this, this is to, to our institution. Um, but just to give you an idea of what we're facing, uh, in 2009, um, out of 6,138 first-time in college students, only 6% of them were college ready in the area of math. 45% of them college ready in reading and 62% in, in writing. Um, in uh, fall 2008, we had nearly 6,200 students enrolled in developmental mathematics, 3,200 in reading, and nearly 1,300 in English. And uh, uh, as I said before, we, nearly, we have around 11,000 students in any given semester that are... May I interrupt you and ask, ask a question? Can we go back a couple of slides? Right there. Um, according to this, 62% uh, of your incoming students are college ready in, in English, in uh, writing. Correct. Is that correct? How, how does that jibe with, with the study that was done by the National Council on Writing a couple of years ago? 
that only 31% of college graduates have adequate, competent writing skills? You know, we've often asked that. The other thing that relates to this is 45% of our students are able to read at college level. Well, writing is a more difficult skill because an expressive skill. And so what, what we uh, have found is that there's more emphasis on writing and on uh, in the high schools, and so students are able to pass the placement test <laughs> at greater numbers than, than the emphasis is on reading. But by the same token, once we talk to our English instructors, college level, we're teaching college level uh, English courses, they don't feel that the placement test is a sufficient test and that oftentimes students do better on the placement test than what their skills actually reflect. And I um, can't answer that in any other way other than we hope that through additional assessments beyond the placement test, uh, we'll be able to address this. One of the things that we are considering is um, doing, and we used to do this and stopped doing that. We became more reliant on just that one placement test because we have such large numbers of students. But one of the things that's been discussed is going back and doing another uh, assessment in the classroom during the first day of class. The problem with that when you have such large numbers is it means students have to change their class schedule and it, and it creates quite a bit of havoc. So those are some of the things that we too are facing that perhaps this doesn't reflect uh, the true college readiness for some of our students now in is English. 60, is this 62, 45, and 6 percent of students who are coming directly out of high school or are these all new students? These are first time figure? in college students, but I haven't gotten them broken down between um, recent high school graduates and people Turning who have been six, out yeah. for more than a few years. Um, at, at, in, at El Paso Community College, we have for many years had mandatory placement testing, mandatory enrollment in developmental education, mandatory new student orientation, and a mandatory student success course for students in university transfer programs. These are all considered best practices, especially for students such as ours who are pre predominantly first generation and uh, with a large number of low income students. But now let me talk to you about some of our interventions and uh, how the grant is helping us to bring change about at our institution. Number one is math. Of course, that is the big, one of the, uh, our students' biggest stumbling blocks. What we've instituted is the math emporiums, and this is quite innovative. Um, math emporiums, instead of having a teacher lecture uh, about certain math topics, what happens is the students come in at the regular time that they would normally have class, but on the first day they take an assessment program, which the, and then they use computer-based uh, activities to improve their their math skills. The teacher is in the classroom at all times. There's also tutors there, and there's a lot of interaction in the classroom. But the person doing the work is not the teacher at the board, but the student at the computer. The teachers are all, the instructors are also able to get the students to work in small groups, and. Um, and then they, uh, they can also work on this at home. What we found is that we have students that are very motivated, and some of our students are, uh, are finishing up two developmental courses in one semester or maybe one and a half, so they're able to move forward. Students, each student might need a different set of competencies, so we're not holding anybody back and making everybody work from point A to point B, rather based on their diagnostics, they'll have to do certain certain um, activities, and it's not, it doesn't apply to all the class, but there are regular examinations, and there are uniform um, 
uh, finals for each class, which the faculty have developed. So we have a variety of ways to assess if indeed the students are getting the information. Again, we're very happy about the motivation that it's promoting within our students. Um, we have, uh, we are developing and will institute a reading, writing integrated course for students in the higher levels of developmental reading and writing. We hope to implement this in the fall. We have a one hour reading course for those students who just have a reading, uh, uh, who, who just need reading, but who place into the higher levels of, of uh, the placement test results. Another uh, intervention which we have is the accelerated learning program in English and we're using the model from the Community College of Baltimore in which students in the same semester are enrolled in a developmental English course and the college level reading course uh, writing course college level English course um, the intensity of it, for some reason, has helped students tremendously. Some of the figures that we are getting, that we have from Baltimore, are that only 26% of students that place into developmental English ever get through college level English. Um, with this program, they're looking at about a 72% pass rate. We just started our program, and but we too are finding that students are doing very, very well. There's eight students in the developmental course, and tw uh, and those are all developmental, uh, of course, students have placed into developmental writing. But then in the uh, college level English, there it's a mixture of students with developmental course needs and students who are just who are at college level. Um, it's been a wonderful experience for the students. Oftentimes, we have the same teacher teaching both sections. Uh, in some says, in some situations, we have two different teachers teaching this. We also have two developmental courses, two developmental English courses being taught together in the same semester, and that's also working out very well. I don't know what it is about that intensity that helps students to get through uh, those courses faster and, uh, and even through their college level English course. So we see a lot of hope with that one. Uh, and we have our learning community. We hope to expand the number of developmental courses that are taught in, in a pair with um, college level courses, or in some instances we have two developmental courses being taught uh, together where students have integrated um, assignments and where the faculty work together um, in a much more integrated uh, manner. The TSI policy that we are looking at um, is uh, is uh, the elimination of late registration because we find that those students that register late oftentimes are students that are are less academically prepared and of course this kind of, this just adds to the, uh, them dropping or not passing the course. Our developmental education council, which is the coordinating council for develop for coordinating council. Uh, has undertaken this goal and is gathering data f and will present it to leadership. Uh, faculty development, again, is very important. Right now, our faculty have participated in uh, the Success Initiative in Developmental Education Math, which has been organized by the coordinating board. But our faculty have come back very enthusiastic about what they've learned. and. It's, it's a very big difference when you see faculty who, for the first time, have gotten to really talk about pedagogy that, that, um, that, will, that works better for adults with developmental course needs. So often, people have just seen it as high school math. Uh, it's not just teaching high school math at a college level. It's much more than that. It's teaching adults with developmental course needs. And so the, pro the activities that have been organized by the coordinating board have been very helpful for us. One of the things that we have on our list of things to do is that we want to offer a three credit graduate course in developmental education for some of our DE faculty. 
Um, this in itself is a revolutionary thing. Again, not many people have additional coursework at the graduate level for developmental education. Um, there are other things that we have done um, within, there's a lot of um, faculty development around the math emporiums, faculty development around the the uh, accelerated learning program and so and all of the interventions that we have so far support services we have a wonderful summer bridge program called project dream um, we have we're working with 120 students this summer and we have and this is funded by the coordinating board as well and um, our students, we address their needs, and this is something we've learned. It's not just a matter of reading, writing, and mathematics, but it's addressing students' needs holistically. So often, students don't feel that they are college material. They don't know how to access services. They don't know how to file their, uh, uh, submit an application for financial aid. So we help them with this, but we also have mentors in the classroom. And, and, and faculty, of course, uh, a lot of people that work with the students. By the end of the summer, we find that the students feel that they belong, that they're connected to the college, and that they know where the dean's office is and where all the services are. Um, we've just been very happy with the results of our, of our project dream. This particular program has been picked up by the National Center for Post-Secondary Research for further evaluation, and we hope that that will add to uh, the knowledge that what we perceive to be true, and that is that participating in these type of programs helps students. And, and our feeling is at a, in El Paso that the more work we do upfront before the first enrollment, the better it is for the students. If we're waiting until they've enrolled and we try to get the information to them, sometimes it's too late. Another support service that we have is the live online math tutoring, which is synchronous online math tutoring. We find that our students go to school in the morning, they work in the afternoon, they pick up the kids, then they go home, and it's not until 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night that they begin studying. So our live online math tutoring is a late evening mandatory online tutoring experience, and we really are anxious to see how um, what the results are on this. But the students themselves before we we attempted this told us that this is what they needed that they didn't they weren't going to be on campus and weren't going to have the time to access the other services the regular services in terms of assessment after placement testing one of the things that we are piloting is other options for students who place at the lower levels of uh, of um, uh, results on the placement test, what we find is that an intake activity is necessary to determine the needs of each student. Students sometimes, especially adults who have been away from school for a while, have uh, a great deal of experience in, in the work area. They may have uh, other types of academic experiences. They may or may not speak English well. There's so much that impacts what a student's choices will be that we feel that intake is a very important part of what we want to do. Um, and another thing that we're finding is that students don't know what colleges have to offer them. When we talk with them, when we explain to them what is credit programs, what are continuing education programs, they are better informed. So we are uh, we have a pilot that will route some students to adult education or some students to our own transition classes. In terms of advising, we're using an intrusive advising model, and that means that we want to get just-in-time information to our students and um, that there's going to be a lot of people that will interact with them in different, in different ways. One of them is through our Early Alert Program. Our Early Alert Program has two, phase, two parts to it. The first part is that we will be administering an, uh, an assessment of non-academic skills 
to students during new student orientation and we'll have workshops and the opportunity for students to speak with advisors before, before the first enrollment. The other part of early alert is that our advisors will go into the classrooms, um, uh, the developmental education classes, and work with the students as a class. Uh, a lot of faculty cooperation is necessary, and we look at to this as a wonderful opportunity to inform our faculty better about the type of advising that they can do. Our prep program is another uh, one of our, um, I think, stellar programs. It won the, the Star Award from the, from the Coordinating Board a few years ago, and our specialists meet with students before their first enrollment with the goal of having students prepare for the college pla for the placement test. None of us would ever take a test without some sort of preparation. And so by having students do this, we are finding, we, our goal is for them to refresh their knowledge, not to learn new knowledge, but um, students when they've gone to high school, very few of them have had the experience of taking a test online. So students come to the prep program, get a diagnostic uh, assessment, find out what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then develop an intervention plan that will help them. Should I use this one? Okay, oh, this is much better. <laughs> Let me tell you about our Adult Basic Education Innovation Grant, and the purpose of this grant is to increase participation and success of adult basic education students in college certificate and workforce training programs for career path employment in high demand jobs in Texas or, and or continued post-secondary education. Um, We've been learning a lot about adult education. We haven't worked well, we haven't worked in a real focused way with this, these partners, but we're beginning to, and we've learned a lot already. We realize that there, in adult education, there are few opportunities sometimes for career exploration. Uh, students have a limited knowledge of the college, the system, and culture. Um, Students have limited practice with college readiness skills, such as note-taking, study skills, time management. Uh, there's no official transcript from the adult education experience, and so we are not sure what the student has done. We find that students have gone, sometimes they come to the college, then they go back to adult uh, education centers, and they come back to the college, and they go to continuing education. It's kind of a mishmash. We have students at all levels. We have students in our developmental education courses that are at literacy level, um, uh, and, and so our lowest level, just uh, of developmental education um, has a wide range of students and um, there's also a wide range of students proficiencies for those students exiting some of the adult education system and so currently we have no alignment between adult education and our own developmental education. It's difficult to track students because we don't know if they've gone to an adult education center because on our Applied Texas application, there is no way in which a student with a GED can indicate whether or not they've, uh, they've attended an adult education center. We find that students um, may need self-advocacy skills and some ways learn to learn uh, how to deal with affective factors in their own lives before entering college. What we've done is we've established the Adult Education Advisory Committee for post-secondary transition. We had our first meeting last week. All of our adult education directors and faculty, lead faculty, attended 
uh, faculty and administrators from uh, El Paso Community College were there. And the discussion was robust about the work that needs to be done, and everybody wants to roll up their sleeves and get started. We've got, we've got to get started with aligning what we do. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Uh, are there employers on that Adult Education Advisory Committee? Do you have the employer community? N no, we don't. I but we, we have, and I'm going to talk about two of our workforce pilots right now, and we have worked with our um, workforce solutions uh, on those two, but not on this advisory committee, and that's a good point. Yeah, that, it, I think it'd be helpful to, to be able to connect those dots and align what you're doing, what the needs that the employers are saying that, they, that okay. they're finding. So I just wanted to bring that no, up. No, thank you. Um, and again, they, um, people are ready to go to work on all of this, and it was very, a very fruitful meeting. I'm very pleased with it. Well, let, let me ask a, a related question. Uh, is there any differentiation between uh, development-led programs that are provided for students who seek to transfer to university and those that are interested in some kind of uh, CTE certificate? some career and technical education certificate? Uh, we don't def differ differentiate um, in, in any way, I don't, I don't think. You mean if they choose to become teachers? Is that no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying that, that, if, that if, a student, uh, if a student goes to a community college and doesn't pass the Accuplacer, uh, do you have a different mode of, of developmental education for those whose objective in a community college is to, is to uh, receive an associate's degree uh, or, or transfer to a university as opposed to those who want some kind of certificate? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting and asking the question that one program should be less rigorous than another. I'm suggesting that maybe there, there should be a heightened level of relevance to, to uh, workforce development in one track compared to the other? Well, your study on the, the low participation rate of the ABE graduates into post-secondary, I think, demonstrated that we didn't have that connection of the relevance to the workplace. Yeah, and, that, and that's my question. Are you doing anything to, to address that and, issue? And that is why in the previous slide we talked about, I, I mentioned the need for information sessions. Students don't know what they don't know, and they don't know what the college, is, what the college offers. And once they learn that they have an option, they can go for a certificate program, and that there are jobs in certain certificate programs, and that, that meets their immediate needs, um, they will opt. In a, and uh, what we're finding is we just aren't explaining it up front as well as we should. Um, they don't. Oh, the intake process, it's important. You can't just talk to a student uh, in a vacuum. What, what are his previous experiences in the, work, in the workforce or academically or personal situation? What, what's impacting the student? So that's what we're seeing, that we need to address these more with better transition. And we don't have that. We just have the placement test, and then they take these developmental courses if they're required uh, uh, prerequisites for their, for whatever they've uh, selected, but they may not have made a very informed selection in terms of a college major or a career choice. We don't, we don't feel that that's been happening right now, where we can differentiate what one student needs over another. Why, why isn't it being done? We haven't, nobody's ever done it. I don't, I think um, Answer the question. El Paso why? Community College probably reflects the, what is happening statewide, that it hasn't been done, that intake hasn't been done sufficiently, that informational sessions prior to new student orientation. And I think if I would address the why of it, it's that there are so many students that come into the college that in order to have these type of activities, it really takes a lot of staff. 
Uh, and the other thing is, I think we just haven't been cognizant of the need to better um, specify our services for students who, with, with different kinds of needs, we haven't done it. And, and that's all I can say. And I think that's probably the practice across the state, as opposed to the, we aren't the exception. <laughs> that's not reassuring. Um, uh, Tamara, are you coming up here? Let, let me ask, while Tamara is walking up here, let, let, let me, let, let me uh, uh, raise another issue. Uh, I, one of the things that we've seen in, in Texas is a proliferation of these student success courses, mm -hmm. these, these one-hour, two-hour credit courses. I, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm appalled by that. It, it, it is inconceivable to me that any developmental ed course would not have embedded in it exposure to, to appropriate study skills and success skills. The last thing these students need is another, a, another course that doesn't lead them directly to a degree that, they, that, uh, that costs them money and that doesn't directly give the student credit for an actual credential of some sort. Um, at our institution, it does give them credit, and it goes beyond the skills, but I have to say that so much uh, integration is needed, and it is being done, where students are getting note-taking skills and time management skills and a variety of skills in the DE courses themselves. Um, there is more that is needed. I mean, the, under, the, the whole idea of, of a career assessment, of really exploring um, what career options are out there, of looking at information a little more critically and uh, uh, with the depth of what our learning frameworks requires of students to do. Um, I think that there is more. I think that, that we feel like some of these issues uh, that students should come to the college with all of this information of what, of what their uh, um, career is going to be and what their um, program of study is going to be and I think what we're finding is that it's not happening and they aren't ready and so but not only is the course needed but exactly what you've said integration of those skills and and in, in many camp uh, campuses and certainly on in our institution there is integration of basic skills as well as the as the student success course I you know I I was a professor for 30 years. It, it, I, never, I never taught a class where I didn't, not a single class where I didn't talk about how students should study, what they should be focusing on, how they should take notes. It, it's inconceivable that, that you should require or that a separate course should be needed to teach students those skills. It's just inconceivable. Any good teacher would do that automatically. And, and yet, you know, on many college campuses, we have um, faculty who are expert in their area, whether it's math or um, uh, biology or anything, any, but they may never have taken a pedagogy class and that it may not be required. And I'd have to say that even in terms of our accrediting uh, agencies, I'm not sure that it's required for people to have pedagogy, even though they're teaching at college and university levels. Uh, for example, even in developmental education, our accrediting agency only requires a bachelor's degree. And for most of, of the, uh, our faculty, a master's degree is required. When I talk to our faculty that have taught in both areas, they'll say, teaching developmental studies is much more challenging than teaching a college level uh, course. Um, I have to agree with them. I think probably more is required in terms of what they uh, should be should have and should bring to the table when they're going to be teaching developmental courses. But I also think all of our faculty would need probably more in terms of pedagogy and how to teach all of these skills. Tamara, we, we need to move on. Tamara, you have some. 
comments to make? Oh, sure. I was just wanting to say uh, in relation to the conversation that um, we are working with the demonstration project schools in this area of differentiating, um, looking at their um, degree programs and certificate programs. San Jacinto College in particular has gone in and evaluated uh, several of the certificate programs, looking specifically at how much math is actually required and then giving, particularly in welding, for example. Um, they found that most of the students would need um, the STEM level track and going in and providing the students with an alternate pathway uh, to help them to be able to accelerate and move on, get that certificate, earning $26 an hour in that in that market uh, in the Houston area if they can complete that basic welding level one certificate. So we are working with the schools using using San Jacinto and then Anson's program uh, with Alamo as one of the models that we were putting forward around. And so I really want to just come in and say that I really want it because of the time sake to really let Anson have a sufficient enough time to really let you see uh, the model that I think really has implications for the state when it comes to this differentiation of placement, this integration of adult basic skills, the study skills and all of that into one model. So I'm going to just turn it over to him and then I'll close um, at the end. And do you have, do, I, do I have I, any uh, questions of Ms. Camacho before we... Uh, and I didn't mean on. to imply that we aren't. That's exactly what the grant is helping us do, is develop those transition classes and those informational sessions and those upfront ways of differentiating and helping students make better and wiser decisions. When you work with adults, I think that really makes a big difference. Commissioner, I'd just like to to add to what you said, I greatly respect what community colleges do. I'm not an expert in education, but I've lived with someone for 16 years who's taught at a community college in biology, and I do think that you have that mixture of students who are coming in at different levels, and even if it's not a developmental education course, when you get into just a regular, for instance, biology course, you're going to have students of all different ages mingling together, and it's challenging those faculty to, it is a special challenge for them to understand how to promote learning and keep, inspire those students that are at different levels. And I wonder, one thing you talk about it is putting a responsibility on the faculty or the staff to do that orientation, but how often peers are engaged in a community college to partner with someone who may have to need a developmental education course. And what I have heard anecdotally through this relationship is that whenever, even in biology, they're partnered together in lab projects, how you can see peer-on-peer -peer support and moving through for someone who may not have the background or may be slow, but there's someone, other student willing to step in and take that role and help and assist someone bringing them up so that the whole group moves along together and doesn't leave a, a team member behind. And the other question that, that I would ask if someone coming into a college level and is having to focus on developmental education courses, which they themselves may not be stimulating to what the college experience is, if they're offered or if there is other courses or activities that will engage them as they may have to focus on those developmental education, but we'll see what the college has to offer for them if they can achieve that developmental education. And so I just wanted to, to add those thoughts. And I just wanted to close with two of our workforce pilots that we're doing exactly that. And I think you may have a handout that uh, with this model, and I know Anson is going to show you his model, which is much more extensive. But one of the things that we've done is we're working with our adult education partners, to, um, and we've been able to recruit two core, uh, two groups of students, uh, one who have chosen to go into the certified nursing assistant program, and one that is in the information technology program. They start out at the adult education centers. They go through ESL and some of their basic skills. They also get some specific health ESL and specific ESL for informational technology. And then we come in where the blue uh, bubbles are there. We've come in and done career exploration and readiness 
and then these students were asked, we had a large group of students, and they were asked if they wanted to continue with these programs. And what we found is we have a very motivated group of students um, in both of these programs. And we have our first cohort that's finished their certified nursing assistant program. We've also worked with them to make sure that they realize that it's a career ladder and they can continue with other health occupations. And then our information technology group is an intensive activity. Um, they're, um, they have their job training four hours a day, and then they have three hours of adult uh, education and vocational ESL. Our goal for both programs are that they complete a GED if they don't have one already, and, um, and then go to work. But we also, again, there's a career pathway for them to come back and finish something else if they choose to. Again, what this shows us is when you work with students and you give them the upfront information that they need, they'll make the choices and we wind up with a motivated group of students that are finishing up and, and, hopefully, and hopefully come back to us when they're ready. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, let, let's let's move on. Uh, yes, Mr. Green. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner, uh, members, uh, uh, staff here, and the public. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Manson Green with Alamo Colleges in San Antonio, Texas, and um, this conversation uh, is uh, hot on the heels of a uh, board meeting we had last night in San Antonio with the Board of Trustees of Alamo Colleges, and uh, indeed, we are on a transformational agenda at Alamo when it comes to uh, finding a solution and a responsive uh, uh, kind of option for our undereducated community. Um, it seems like in San Antonio we've kind of said we've got to get rid of the silos of people that are in college and people that are in adult ed and, and the unemployed and those that are underemployed and really look at our community in general and bring kind of draw to take those lines away and really start to look at the solution as something that is a very synergistic and integrated solution. Um, you know, we listened to the hearing last week in the higher ed committee and, you know, the, the whole question of what to do with folks that are below the eighth grade level, below the fifth grade level um, in San Antonio that is a, a, a tremendously large population. So um, part of what we'll speak to you about is what we're doing on the adult ed side, but I kind of want to say that uh, it's very much integrated with the developmental education uh, project that we're doing in Alamo, and we are looking at this as really what do we do with underskilled and underprepared students that are in the Alamo colleges and in the San Antonio community. Um, real quick, uh, we are a five college system, um, and I'm here with Carrie Tupa, who is our co-director for the initiative. Um, we are both situated uh, in the Economic and Workforce Development Department, so our focus is uh, economic development, workforce development, um, but our, our customers are underskilled students and the employers that they desire to wish uh, to work uh, for. Um, so we support our colleges through strategic planning, innovation development. Um, student support and are kind of the interface to the college system to state and local and national initiatives when it comes to adult education and workforce development. Um, this is kind of the elevator speech that many of us have seen um, from Mr. Murdoch's research about participants in workforce training programs. And when I look at this, I say, okay, we've, we've got uh, a, a model in our training programs, in our community colleges, in our adult basic education programs that is designed for customer bases that are declining in population over the next 20 or 30 years. And our Hispanic population is rapidly uh, increasing as participants participants in those programs. And of course, with that population, um, we know we have lower educational attainment, lower reading, lower graduation rates, but also higher dropout rates, higher unemployment rates, and higher rates of limited English proficiency. So we look at this and say, okay, we've got to redesign and retool what we're doing in Alamo to adjust and be more responsive to a new customer base. Um, we know the legacy system in adult basic education doesn't work. Um, we have students that enter the system. They may come in as ESL students and take multiple levels. They may come in as English-speaking adult basic education students. Um, maybe they'll get into a GED program. The transition rates are pretty small. 
college readiness gets even smaller, and those that enter developmental education, very small, single-digit rates in terms of out of adult ed into community college, even developmental programs. Getting into college and getting into work or four-year degree programs um, is way on down the road. And if you look at the research, we see students are dropping out after maybe a year, maybe less of ESL. If they come in as English speakers, they're dropping out very low. So we've got a system there where 7% uh, basically in the adult ed system are entering post-secondary education. Um, and that's just, that's a broken system. Um, I think we're pretty well aware of that. And that's something just we, we can't stand for in San Antonio and definitely at Alamo Colleges. Um, so we started to look at the literature uh, of what was going on in the country, and um, most of us, or many of us, are well aware of the Washington State uh, studies that were going on in the mid-2005, uh, 2004, related to really where do we start to see a tipping point when it comes to uh, wages, when it comes to success, how much training, what kind of training, uh, what kind of certifications do students need, and the tipping point studies done by Mr. Jenkins um, kind of pointed many of us in the directions of looking at ways to integrate training models into credit programs, into certificate programs, but also doing that in a timely manner so that students aren't spending four or five years in a system, but uh, less than one. And also, uh, what else is required? Is it just educational interventions, or is there a broader framework of support that that students need to meet that outcome. Um, so uh, what we're going to speak the rest of this presentation on is really about how we're implementing the IBEST model, the Integrated Basic Education Skills Training model that was um, uh, innovated and, and brought out of uh, Washington State and is being deployed uh, in, I think, 68 of their colleges in the state, uh, over 140 programs in Washington. Um, and we're taking a bold leap in San Antonio and uh, have started in January with the help of the Coordinating Board ABE Innovation Grant, as well as some other funds through the Department of Labor uh, to help us innovate and bring that uh, program into the Alamo system. So we're going to tell you about that in just a second. Also, a little bit about our performance and findings to date. Um, that's where things get really exciting for us because we, we we wanted to go into this and make sure that you know, it was, wasn't one of these projects where at the end of the grant we said, wow, it was great, but we really you know can't do it anymore. We've got to bring this to scale. We've got to integrate this and turn it into a sustainable uh, model and option for our customers in San Antonio. Carrie's going to talk a little bit about um, IBEST variations and kind of what we're talking about with IBEST. So I'll let her uh, give us a real overview of that. So uh, in terms of IBEST, the sort of general model that's uh, looked at is this sort of overlap of technical instruction and basic skills instruction. So you have reading, writing, math, or language basic skills integrated uh, with technical training, and there's a lot of contextualization that's going on in that basic skills instruction. Uh, and when we started this program in January at San Antonio College, we went in and let them know, you know, there's this idea of, of how this started in Washington State, but we don't want to go in with any, you know, predetermined model. We want to design a model that's really going to work for our customer base, for our students, for our population. Uh, and right around this time, uh, the most recent report came out um, from Jenkins and actually identified four sort of different models of, of IBEST implementation. Um, so in terms of uh, the models, the first model is just um, you have your technical training class, but then you have a basic skills or ESL instructor that's sort of serving as a, an, a support role. So you think of this more as like a tutoring role. Um, and this is a model that's uh, seen, and it's a little more common. Um, but this next model uh, is what we're actually deploying in one of our medical assisting classes, uh, and it's a medical terminology class that we determined has a really heavy reading focus. Um, so what we have is we have sort of a stacked model of technical training and basic skills instruction. And so for our students, they attend a regular, they're co-enrolled with regular students in a medical terminology class with a developmental reading instructor that sits in the classroom with them. And then after that time, they have a breakout session with that instructor who sort of reinforces um, a lot of the developmental reading concepts that they need to apply to be able to engage the content that they are covering in that particular class. Um, the third model uh, that has come out of Washington State, uh, we are actually uh, 
kind of by accident uh, stumbled upon in one of our classrooms um, is sort of a partially integrated instruction. So here we have the two instructors teaching at the same time in the classroom. Um, and we've actually used this in our uh, medical law and ethics class, which is another medical assisting class that we determined has a really heavy writing focus. So in this class, we took a three-hour technical class. Our students are co-enrolled with regularly enrolled students, but one of those hours is completely devoted to developmental writing. So the entire class is participating in learning new writing strategies because when we started having these conversations with the technical fac faculty at San Antonio College, they said, well, you know, our students, some of them might have gone through developmental writing, but they're still needing these skills. Um, and so what we're seeing here is more of a redesign of the actual class. Um, and in our most recent conversations with one of the instructors, she said, I will never again teach this class without having this writing support built in. So you're really seeing kind of a redesign of how that teacher's teaching. Um, and then the fourth model is just a more heavy, um, heavy dose of kind of what you saw in the last model. Uh, you see a bigger change in the technical class. You see more engagement from the basic skills instructor. So let me tell you a little bit about the students. We haven't kind of talked about who are we talking about that are in these classes. Um, we have a group, uh, and we're going to focus on our medical assisting program. That's our credit program that we're implementing with the IBEST model. Um, we've got a group of students that range in ages from their late 50s through their, some in their 40s, some in their 20s. Um, some of the students are uh, limited English proficient. We have a foreign trained health worker in that program that's learning English, um, would be kind of a higher level uh, limited English proficient student. Um, we're also serving persons with disabilities, and we have a, a very strong partnership with the Department of uh, Assistive and Rehabilitative Services. So some of our students also are receiving uh, services through DARS, but also accommodations on our side when it comes to the instructional and assessment mechanisms. Um, so if we look at kind of the groups of students that are in Alamo colleges. We've got our higher functioning students that are going to enter into regular credit program training or uh, regular programs at the Alamo colleges. And our IBEST cohort is that group that either just missed meeting standard employment uh, or standard uh, entry requirements or students that are functioning at a lower level. Um, the group that's uh, that we're really not uh, focusing on with the IBEST treatment would be non-English speakers, non-readers, the one, uh, the students that really require a more intensive intervention before they can enter into a technical program. Um, so a little bit about the medical assisting program and, and what we're seeing in terms of performance. Um, we're, uh, as Carrie alluded to, we're, we're focusing on three credit programs right now. And we went in and kind of analyzed the curriculum for each of these programs and found that some of them are very heavy in reading. Uh, those textbooks are pretty thick and they've got a pretty dense uh, reading content. Uh, the medical law and ethics, as Carrie was uh, leading, uh, describing, has a strong writing focus. They have to write an APA style paper at the end of that. And then we have a computer applications program where uh, some of our students are coming in with a very limited computer skills. Some are coming in with Facebook pages. So uh, we have to kind of make sure that we're supporting uh, the computer side of student engagement because so much of their work in the, in the college environment is going to require computers. And in medical assisting in particular, there are a lot of computer-based applications in the medical field. So let's talk about performance. And Carrie's going to walk us through what we're seeing to date. So these are students that started in January. They've been in class for four months. Um, and we've been monitoring, first, who they are, what their scores look like. We correlated things into grade levels so that we can kind of have a, a common language for people to kind of gravitate around. Um, and then we're going to see how they're doing in standard credit-based medical assisting courses. So Carrie? Uh, so, as Anson said, you know, we looked at a, a couple of different assessments when these students entered our program. They were required to take the AccuPlacer test to be able to access credit classes, uh, but we also tested them in adult basic education assessments just to kind of see where they were grade level wise. Um, and this placement isn't isn't relevant uh, until the next slide here, but just to kind of show you, we have a broad spectrum here of grade levels. We have students performing ninth grade level. We have a student that, uh, and again, this is a reading level here. We have a student who is 
was reading as low as fifth grade level, uh, sixth grade level. Um, but just to kind of see how the students placed in terms of developmental education, we have students, they all tested below what is considered the floor for being entered into the medical assisting program. So if these students were to, to take classes the normal route, they would be required to take either one, two, or three levels of developmental reading before they would be allowed in, in this in any of these three particular classes. Um, but in terms of what we're seeing of their current performance in the IBEST classroom is we have Delilah here who uh, tested at the fifth grade, or she read at the fifth grade level back when she first started the program. And in her medical law and ethics class, she currently has a 79. Uh, we have Yolanda, who's one of our limited English proficient students. She was reading at a seventh grade level. She's holding her own with a 70 in the medical law and ethics class. Uh, Elda, ninth grade level, has a 75. We have Maria at a 10th grade level with an 85. So you see these students were all admitted below, you know, what would normally be considered ready for, for college or ready for these programs, but using the IBEST model, um, they're, they're holding their own in these classes uh, and passing them. One thing I want to back up here real quick and show you something. Um, we notice we have kind of the acupuncture scores there on the left, and then we have uh, grade levels on the right. And what, what we're doing, and, and I'll like describe our assessment process in a minute, um, what you're seeing there is two different tools that are being used. We assess students uh, using a CASAS written test, a reading and writing paper-based test, and that's where we're getting our grade levels. So those are going to be test scores correlated to the national reporting system, um, and uh, they, they can yield us grade level requirements. Uh, or, or numbers, and then the acupuncture scores would be that computer-based uh, assessment. Something that's interesting there, if you look at Elda at the bottom there, um, Elda's 59 years old, uh, had never used a computer, so she came in um, and she uh, took uh, a CASAS test and scored at a ninth grade level. It was a written-based test. She had, hadn't been out of school for 40 years, uh, but she took her acupuncture test and scored very, very low because of their com computer skills. So she would have never ever gotten close to being admitted into even really our lower level developmental ed classes. But she's in that class, probably one of the higher performers in that class. So the message to us was uh, assessment is a very important piece and we'll, we'll talk about that because um, uh, one size fits all assessment tools and, and methodologies uh, are probably excluding a lot of students that may be high performing um, that um, can show a real strong performance on other types of instruments. Um, and that was kind of an unexpected finding as we kind of went through and started to look at the test scores. Um, cost savings. Uh, this was something on everybody's mind, and um, I would never put this up against, you know, uh, the finance officer or any institution because we're really doing this as we fly. But we started to really look at this because everybody's asking the question, and the first thing everyone says about IBEST is, well, that's an impossible uh, uh, model because it's twice as expensive as anything else. And in Washington State, they give a whole lot more money towards it than we'll ever get in Texas. Um, so, you know, at first I said, well, maybe they're right. But then I said, well, you know, let's just see and start to see what these numbers fall out uh, and look like. Uh, last night, one of our uh, uh, board members, uh, Gene Sprague, uh, made the comment and said, well, you know, uh, whatever you're doing has got to be vastly less expensive than what we're doing now, putting people through years of development led with no outcomes or limited outcomes. Um, those students may be ending up on public assistance and food stamps, lower uh, rates of tax paying. So uh, we've got to really look at what cost means. Um, first off for us, this is an answer to 87% of our student population that's in developmental education that hasn't had options like this in the past. Um, but we went through and looked at uh, the, the students that are in this medical assisting program, three of them would have re re required three levels of developmental reading, two of them two levels of DE. Um, and the message is, is they would have required that, but they're in a class right now that's a credit level class with standard enrollment students, and they're passing, they're all passing, and some of them are doing very well um, and engaged very well in the, the program. Um, 
if we looked at the cost of tuition, if they had just taken those DE courses over a period of a year and a half or two or three years, or close to $10,000 for that group of students, uh, and their chances of ever getting into medical assisting and standard enrollment would be about 5 to 17 percent. So um, I start to look at that and I say, well, this is the way we need to be looking at the numbers and thinking about it. Um, the treatment that we're providing right now when it comes to the tuition and the uh, uh, supplemental instruction that they're receiving is about $2,400. Um, and that's just a semester, but they're performing now in the class. Um, they may need some more support as we move forward. Um, that's what we're monitoring. That's what we're looking at. We're going to be doing a, some post-testing on them in a few weeks, and that's going to start to see just where they are um, in terms of their development. Um, what's missing here um, would be the development costs, and that's something Carrie and I just uh, haven't totaled up, but we've put a lot of time into this in terms of curriculum development, staff development, training. So there are those costs at the ramp up of any program like this, and that's that's a number that we're very interested in as, as our board challenges us to scale and build this into the future. Let me just show you a little bit about the bigger picture of what we're doing. We've been talking about medical assisting, but that program is embedded in several different programs that we're implementing um, in the health sectors and then in the sustainability green sectors. So we have uh, uh, different variations of the IBEST model being implemented, uh, some of them for students that lack a GED and high school diploma there. So we have our certified nurse aide and our weatherization and solar photovoltaic installer program, and then um, credit programs the medical assisting, which we're deploying now, dental assisting, which we'll have in the fall, and community health worker, which we'll be uh, implementing this summer. And part of the messaging here, here is, and this is what we talk to students about when we go through orientations in our weekly information sessions, is that um, we want them to continue education. This is a good way to get in. If you're a low, lower performing student, we can help you with a very intensive model um, that's got some strong innovation built into it. But keep your eye into the future because to get into real sustaining career building jobs uh, we need to move into AAS degrees and bachelor degrees. Um, let me talk a little bit about our quality model because it's not just about instructional redesign. Um, first off, I had mentioned assessment and you know so often we think of assessment and people confuse that with testing. We do a lot of testing in Alamo colleges and most, most colleges and adult basic education programs do lots of testing, but whether they do assessment in terms of looking at the broader range of what students come in with, what their goals and objectives are, what their past work experience is, um, those questions aren't being asked and anybody that's worked in English as a second language has the story of, you know, the student that was the, the engineer that was in their class with students that were migrant seasonal farm workers and said, this is not right. Why didn't someone ask this student, you know, what their educational background is? They can, they could benefit from a different type of ESL program. So we're working with uh, uh, Kale uh, you know, on the prior learning assessment model and really looking at strategic ways to prov provide a very robust assessment program. Um, Rick Giannis and Dana DeOyos here uh, behind me are part of our assessment team and um, they came up to kind of see what we're doing today. Um, um, and hear from uh, the, uh, the group, um, but I think our assessment model is something that has proven uh, to be very, uh, very effective in helping us uh, identify student needs as well as uh, develop kind of a more strategic instructional responses to what those needs might be. Um, so students go through this uh, assessment protocol with us, and that helps us work with students to make more informed decisions about the next steps for them. So we've got students that might be uh, coming in 7th to 10th grade, they're motivated, they're ready for an intensive program, we've talked to them about what going to college is going to be like, um, do they have the commitments and the support from home to make that kind of uh, a leap into inner college. Um, most of our students are working, they're uh, in their 30s and 40s, so they're career transitioning out of different careers. Um, we've got veterans in our programs, persons with disabilities, limited English proficient populations, unemployed 
unemployed, dislocated workers. So we're, we're reaching out to some broad groups. Um, and part of that assessment process is really helping them see how they're best situated for performance and helping us provide a strong intervention. Some students come in and um, they're ready for college. You know, they, they find out about our program, they think it looks good, but really they don't need the extra intervention. They're, they're well prepared, they're ready to go. Uh, and then some students come in um, a little too underskilled to really survive in an IBES uh, program. So our message to them is, uh, you know, we're open all year. This program's circular and it's going to be offered next year and next semester. Um, let's get into a contextualized GED program or ESL program, get them in so that they're in the program, but they're not completely in the IBES program. And that helps us stay engaged with them. Um, oftentimes those students also just don't have the time to commit. And they can say, I can do, you know, six hours a week, but I can't, I'm, I'm not ready to do a daytime uh, program because I'm working two jobs and I, I can't quit my day job. So we, we find out that information up front and then we work with a student and really it's a, it's a no wrong term policy over there at Alamo Colleges when it comes to helping students make good decisions. Um, a little bit more on the supportive and employment services. Um, our focus is getting to the finish line on jobs. Um, we, we, our message is constantly with faculty, with students, that uh, the educational piece is critical, but let's keep our eyes on what we need to do to be ready for work and, and help students make that transition. Um, it's a workforce development program and has that strong focus. Um, our educational case manager, Rick Giannis, behind me is our lead uh, educational case manager, and he coordinates with multiple agencies in San Antonio to help uh, provide both support services and employment services for our students. We kind of went into the model and said, we're, we're not going to try to do everything uh, at the Alamo Colleges. We can't. We need to leverage the community support and the agencies that are experts at working with different student populations and find win-win relationships with those agencies, and that has served us very well. Our National GI Forum group uh, provides us uh, a, a really a new customer base of veterans that are returning from uh, uh, war or have been out of war for many years um, and they have real specific needs but they also have other supports that they can draw from uh, in terms of VA benefits and other things. Um, I mentioned the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services, um, our workforce development partners with uh, SARE Jobs for Progress and Workforce Solutions Alamo and a special uh, job development organization called Career Finders are some of the organizations we work with. Business engagement, as I mentioned, was very important, and, and I know Mr. Temple um, uh, had mentioned that earlier uh, this afternoon. We we don't think that going into any kind of training initiative without en employer engagement is a good idea. So we have employers help us with curriculum development. Um, we help the help them. Um, they, they help us give us guidance on where the industries are going. In our sustainability sector, uh, those of you know that are following that know it's very fast moving, and requirements are moving quickly in that and it's a very fickle market and so that's something that we want to make sure that we're providing good information to our students and that our faculty um, are well prepared in the classroom with what's going on um, with the businesses. Um, the picture there is a, a, a business breakfast that we had a few weeks ago for sustainability employers. We had 87 uh, attendees there, had breakfast tacos, talked about what's going on in the industry but we also had a structured feedback session where we have them talk to us about what curriculum they need, what programs need to be developed, and, and what programs that we have that need to be retooled. So we try to stay real relevant and real engaged with them because if we don't have them on our side, how can we really do a decent job with our students that are looking for work? So I'll be happy, uh, Carrie and I will be very happy to take some questions and comments from uh, the members here. Questions? I have a question. Please. Um, Anson, I know a part of the grant was that you would work in partnership with the adult basic ed or the adult ed program. What's the role of the adult ed program in this project? project? Uh, that's an excellent uh, question, Jenny. Um, we have a very, very strong partnership with our mul uh, adult education uh, providers in San Antonio. We have several different agencies that provide that. and. Um, we really are getting more out of that relationship than we had ever bargained for. We, we kind of 
always saw them as a feeder program for our college programs um, and also as a kind of core basic education uh, provider because we don't receive any federal funds for adult basic education but we've really stepped that up especially with our partnership with region 20 educational service center and um, we have one emerging with Seguin ISD where um, as part of our IBEST uh, certified nurse aid program um, they're actually providing the vocational ESL contextualized curriculum for certified nurse aid at no cost to our students um, through their federal funds and then through our grant and uh, we're providing the actual technical training. So there we have uh, an integrated model, two funding sources, um, very strong leveraging of local, uh, well, the money that's in the community already and it's a win-win for them. They, they need employment outcomes, they need engagement with the colleges, we need ways to make this lower cost and more integrated with what's going on in the community already. Um, that was something that we really didn't plan on happening, um, and it, it's just snowballing. I mean, as we grow our program, um, each of these providers, I mentioned Seguin, they're saying, we want to do this now in New Braunfels, and in Seguin, help us out with a model. So uh, that's been a real strong piece, and uh, I encourage you know TEA, of course, to kind of look at that. I think they, they've been looking at that as something that we need to be doing, because for, for too many years, those those worlds have been siloed and um, we've never gotten close to kind of integrating funding like that. Um, the benefit for students is uh, tremendous. Right. Do you think that this model will be able to be replicated in other areas of the state? Absolutely. I, I see no reason why. I mean, all it really takes is, you know, some brave people that have some inside innovation, strong leadership uh, within the organizations that say yes. Uh, I think the one thing that um, I hear people say is that uh, oftentimes they can't get people in the room together to talk about a topic like this because of just, you know, uh, they're siloed. And that might be within the college itself where you've got, you know, the CE people and the technical people on the credit side not talking or the DE people and the, you know, other people in the organization. Or maybe interagency where you've got the adult ed and the college people or workforce development teams not working together. So it takes that leadership. And at Alamo Colleges with Dr. Leslie and, and Dr. Zaragoza uh, at our chancellor and vice chancellor levels and our board seeing things in the synergistic whole that has made our work work I mean uh, without that kind of leadership it would be very very hard if we didn't have that kind of buy-in so the replication is there we have uh, uh, programs coming to see our model and, and trying to figure out how it works and um, that's something I, I'll say also about Alamos we're out to help other programs do this because we've got to be on the bigger mission for the state of Texas well, it sounds like El Paso Community College and, and you ought to talk about. We were just talking about, you know, models. plane flights before the meeting. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I propose until the dust storms in El Paso stop that you meet in San Antonio. I very, very good. <laughs> we got the river walking fiesta if you want to come down next week. <laughs> we'll wait for Tamara to come. Okay. In. What, what are the uh, this program has been in place since January so what 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 do you what kind of data do you have about how um, it's actually working uh well, right now, we know it's uh, really most of what, you know, we kind of went in with a continuous improvement model where we're not going to let things languish for 48 hours if we know it's not working. So that was one of the commitments that, you know, I came into the team and said, we're going to work on this and we're going to work really hard, but we've got to be responsive because there's too much at stake for us to wait until the end of the semester or to wait and, and say what happened and scratch our heads. So uh, Carrie and I are real intrusive on this with the faculty and with the staff. And, and get involved. We have pulled people out of classes and put new people in. We've developed new interventions. We've written Tamara and her staff and said, can we add this component to it? Because what we thought was going to work last summer when we wrote this thing isn't working. We need to make this tweak. And that flexibility has really helped us be responsive. Um, we've got about 130 individuals that are in different parts of this program right now. They've either just been assessed yesterday or this morning, um, or they're in our college 
preparatory program or some of them are in the IBES training in the different occupations. So we're moving real aggressively. After last night, uh, the one negative that, you know, we got from the board was that we need more. This is not enough, you know, so um, we've got the heave ho to really scale this up tremendously uh, from our board of trustees. And of course, that's a good position for us to be in because we've got support here at the coordinating board. We've got some funding through coordinating board and Department of Labor, and we've got some real talent on our team to kind of lift this to another level. Yeah. Tim, right, you, you know, wind things up? Sure. Um, I just want to say, Commissioner, that um, the Alamo program and what the demonstration project schools are doing is really helping us to diversify uh, our appropriations when it comes to adult basic education. You know, we've got the intensive programs that's a very short term uh, bridge for the students who have a GED who really are on a degree track for an um, associate's degree and want to transfer to a four year school. But we think the possibilities around adult basic education innovation is really direct to go because it provides um, options for more students at lower levels, which is that target that, you know, we talked about and really worked for through the tri-agencies. I just want to remind um, uh, and the council that the coordinating board has $5 million left that we're awarding out right now. I think um, this is a really exciting time for the tri-agencies. It's the first time we've come together and done a joint competition, the three agencies working together. Um, so we really are hopeful that we can take what Anson is doing, um, really try to support him as being a leader institution in this to help us to try to begin to scale this. Um, we've got programs that are helping people to um, get certificates in becoming CNC machinists in Tarrant County, um, information, health information specialists in Houston. So we were really um, hopeful about, um, you know, what this can do to really move and push the envelope about the living wage portion. I just want to really um, just stress that, that um, we're really trying to think about and rethink adult basic education delivery in a way that is not really happening. Well, as, as, you, as you've heard me say many times before, I, I think it is, it, it's, it's very naive to imagine that a, that a single parent with two or three children, uh, small children, somebody who, who um, dropped out of high school, that we can expect that they're going to get a GED and then they're going to get some other kind of credential. They need jobs that pay living wages. And then we should look at our educational strategy in Texas as a generational one, not something that we expect that we're going to fix from uh, uh, in, in, in one generation with uh, individuals who are, who are grossly in need of basic uh, academic skills. I, ju I just don't think it's practical to think that uh, that uh, these people can afford to, to spend four or five years getting some kind of advanced post-secondary credential. They need basic skills training and they need jobs. Well, and the good part is, is that these um, projects are able to get the, get them into training, get them into a job, but it's informing them about what the rest of the pipeline is. So they want to come back. They are informed about what the career pathway options are, and we may, we may very well see these same people return back and then move on into degrees and and possibly go beyond that. But I think getting them that immediate quick success is what's going to really drive um, the direction that we're going, and we will make sure to keep the council apprised of the developments with these projects, the new grants we plan to award uh, this summer and into the fall, and we can provide ongoing updates to the council um, at, that you'll be chairing for the next couple of years. Now, the other thing that struck me about your presentation, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that AccuPlacer scores are useful at all. There didn't seem to be any correlation, whatever. I know it was a small sample size that you put up on the screen, but there seemed to be no correlation between AccuPlacer scores and how students actually did developmental ed. Yeah, that was definitely one of our most surprising findings, and uh, it's something that we want to sort of experiment with a little more, but, uh, and we had a, a little bit better data slide in terms of showing where they are along the scale this way in adult basic education and where they are in terms of AccuPlacer, but yeah, exactly, there's no correlation that we're finding whatsoever, so and it's... It, and it really echoed, I mean, this was kind of the aha moment of many that we've had, but when we started talking to faculty, they, you know, they said, well, they, they, I remember in the summer, they brought us some um, writing samples. And, and I said, well, tell me, show me some writing that is in a medical assisting program. Oh, I'll show you some writing. They brought us some writing samples, and, you know, we saw some, 
They look like the writing samples of our students. Same with reading. So, you know, students are getting in. Um, you know, the acuplacer, I just think, is not a, a very strong indicator for performance in many ways. You know, it's, a, it's an indicator. But um, especially for non-traditional students, students that have been, you know, like some of our students that have never taken a computer-based program. Um, most of our students don't own computers. Um, and so using that as kind of the gatekeeper mechanism to get them into technical training um, is, is something that we've got to really consider. Um, our, like I said earlier, our assessment mechanism is, is um, deep and, and uh, probably way more costly than, than could be scaled. And that's one of the, the questions we're exploring right now with our developmental ed team is uh, we know it works very well. So what are the elements that we can take out of it in our triage process, in our qualitative process? What are the elements that we can lift out to find some economy um, and then go from dozens of individuals to hundreds and thousands and still um, get somewhere better when it comes to placement and guidance for students, and we, we know we can achieve that. Or even, Anson, what are some elements of that assessment that could be done in an adult basic education right. class mm -hmm. and then that could be transferred to transferred you so over. that you wouldn't have to provide it yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is important to note that the model of, a, of assessment that Anson's uh, program is using is exactly that multiple sources of multiple sources of evidence that Dave Connolly is talking about. So the fact that now we have a model of one seeing actually in place and then trying to find that economy of skill I think is going to be really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. well, it sounds to me we need some more data on from other campuses on the relevance of the acuplacer, and uh, if, if it's not if it's not very useful, we ought to just dump it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the reason why you know we will be looking at our assessment instrument and trying to figure out using feedback from the grantees on coming up with an assessment that may contribute to the economy of scale question of can you remove some of these additional assessments that he has to do because the one assessment that the state has right now, the, the, the assessments we have are not working. So I think that this program is so critical. We're looking to try and to expand their funding. They're reapplying for additional funds. We want programs like this. These are the ones we want to invest in because we need them standing as models um, and helping. And I, and I just have to, I want to say this publicly that we appreciate the, um, the way that this project is willing to mentor other programs. Um, they're not funded for that, and they're doing it, and this is what we really want to see, so they definitely deserve to be recognized. Thank you. Any, any other questions? It, it's not a question, but a, just a comment I noticed on your support uh, that you're integrating back in there. There's several references to case management from DARS or from the GI program and, uh -huh. and something that the Commissioner Paredes talked about is that an adult education that may have uh, a parent that with three children that's struggling and what's part of what they're struggling with perhaps is their children have medical or health needs. The so often these we, we cycle through in our own little silos mm -hmm. whether they're health and uh, or education but uh, one thing that may be available for additional support is if the the, the children are, do, are on Medicaid. There's the Texas Health Steps Medical Case Management Program. And sometimes just offering a, a, a parent who's struggling in an adult education because of that, making sure they are hipped up with a, a case management on that end that just helps relieve the pressure on another end. Mm -hmm. And so I applaud the efforts of trying to pull in a comprehensive support uh, for helping these students move through that system. Yeah, we just see it as absolutely critical. And, um, you know, that has been, I mean, we just added a new partner yesterday with AARP so that some of our students over 40 now are, are able to get stipends. Uh, money, you know, to actually live on. So uh, we just constantly seek that information. Um, I didn't mention Project Quest. It was in our slide, but Project Quest is a faith-based, community-based organization in San Antonio that is is all about seeking out and finding those kind of resources for students, and they have just been a critical element to our project over the years and to this project. But uh, that's something that I think is in terms of best practice. You know, I, I always 
want people to know it's not just about instruction. It's not just about assessment. There's this broader framework that many, many of our students in our system uh, actually, absolutely need to be successful in programs. And those resources are in the communities. Sometimes they're just siloed and running in different directions. And it's about corralling those uh, groups together, finding win-wins, and, and moving forward on an agenda. And we'll have data for you, Commissioner. They'll be reporting every semester, and we'll keep you apprised, the council, of the outcomes of their student cohorts. Kale, okay, well, thank you very much for this presentation. Congratulations on your good work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, uh, are there any uh, uh, closing comments? Uh, what, what I would like to do is, is uh, make sure that uh, any uh, agenda items that you would suggest for the uh, council uh, get uh, get discussed and get submitted to uh, our staff here and uh, we want to make sure that we follow through on the priorities I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting uh, college success uh, college readiness uh, getting back to the question Larry Temple how is it that we're so completely out of sync between K-12 and higher education um, we, we've we've taken some steps in the right direction, but we're still a long way from solving the problem on a statewide basis. Uh, linking up uh, uh, education, particularly higher education, more closely with workforce development because we know that 80% of people go to college to get a job. And so we, we need to make sure that there's a closer linkage. And uh, David, uh, during the time that I've been on this council, we have not paid sufficient attention to the issues that DARS is concerned about. So we need to find ways to do that more effectively. Well, unless there are any final comments or questions, uh, I think we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.